thank you. It's, um, it's lovely to see some very familiar faces, some dear friends, and I'm very much looking forward also to meeting some of the other friends, even friends even though it's virtual. It's, um, it's really a pleasure to, uh, to be involved with this initiative. Thank you, Jeff, for, for everything that you've done and for getting this, this wonderful group together. Um, I've been following with interest some of the discussions and um, I would like to return the focus a little bit, perhaps to something more esoteric in a sense. Um, and I would like to very briefly reflect on the possibility of establishing a global environmental constitution. Um, through the lens of the Anthropocene and global environmental constitutionalism. Now, this is a severely abbreviated version of a 60-page paper that I've been working on. So if any one of you needs some material to fall asleep at night, I can be very happy to send it to you, the fuller version. Um, but I'll try my best now just to present uh, really a, a, a short version of this paper. Um, I think to start with, there is uh, no disagreement um, that earth system integrity is being eroded to a point where it really becomes uh, impossible to assume the continuance of a relative stable, resilient and harmonious earth system as we have done uh, in the Holocene. And we are crossing critical planetary boundaries while causing a state sh a shift in Earth's biosphere as we are entering the Anthropocene. Now, as a critical part of the various regulatory interventions that seek to mediate the human environment interface, environmental law, I'm sure we will agree, will play an important part in humanity's efforts to navigate the Anthropocene. But at the same time, the Anthropocene also has far-reaching normative implications for environmental law, and specifically for international environmental law. But as Tim Stevens has pointed out, most accounts of international environmental law have yet to come to grips with the immense implications and consequences of the Anthropocene. And I believe that new alternative ways must be found to reform international environmental law if we were to more effectively respond to the socio-ecological crisis of the Anthropocene. And one of the possibilities to do that is possibly through the constitutionalism paradigm. Um, the only challenge here is that our understanding of constitutionalism is a distinctly domestic one. Um, and for constitutionalism to play any meaningful role thinking about international environmental law reforms, it must be translated to the global regulatory sphere. And this is where the concept of global environmental constitutionalism comes in, which we will discuss a little bit later. So it's my hypothesis that international environmental law, because it has probably pushed us, it helped push us into the events that have caused or that are causing the Anthropocene, and because it is not fully uh, 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 capable or designed to help us dealing with the Anthropocene, requires significantly radical, binding, and substantive global constitutional norms, which could be entrenched in a global constitution. Now, many, many commentators have offered various uh, proposals for such a constitution, uh, such as the Earth Charter. Peter, you would, you would, you would be specifically familiar with that narrative. Um, and of course, the IUCN Draft International Covenant. But I want to focus on the World Charter for Nature of 1982, which very curiously seems to have slipped off the radar of state's concerns. Uh, before I do so, as a point of departure, I think we must agree um, that it's clear that the failures of international environmental law, along with the failures of many other new liberal regulatory institutions, have not enabled humanity during the past century to sufficiently mitigate harmful practices, to adapt, to global social ecological change and to build resilient and peaceful societies. As our friend Anna Greer says, if anything, there seems to be a deepening of new liberal capitalist ideologies grip on mainstream international strategies for addressing the eco-crisis. And much of Western law and culture, which includes international law, as an extension of Western commitments and power, seems committed to maintaining business 
as usual, as usual, a reductive set of capitalist globalized practices, which is hugely problematic. If we accept this is true, then arguably the reforms that will be required of international environmental law as part of this rubric of legal norms must be at a scale, level and depth never seen before. It will probably be akin to those global law and governance reforms following World War II, a period in history which arguably represent the last major global constitutional moment. And I suspect one could see the Anthropocene as representing the most current um, global constitutional moment. And it is a global constitutional moment which might also announce the critical need to create a global environmental constitution. And the creation of such a constitution must of course be seen in the context of the global constitutionalism paradigm, which is um, and now an autonomous field of scholarly critique, if not as yet a powerful political or normative reform program. Um, the global constitutionalism um, narrative is, is, can be very context specific and the literature on this topic is truly overwhelming. Um, so I always prefer to go with um, Anna Peters' description, which says that Global constitutionalism is the claim of probably all types of global constitutionalism is that the respective principles, institutions and mechanisms of domestic constitutionalism can and should be used as parameters to inspire strategies for the improvement of the legitimacy of an international legal order and institutions without asking for a world state or government. Now the global constitutionalism debate essentially commenced with the reconstructions of the founding treaties of the United Nations, European Union, and the World Trade Organization. Um, and it concerns the juridification or legalization of international relations, and that these relations should be governed by legal rules instead of merely by state powers and interests. While the legitimacy of international law should not solely depend on state consent, but also on considerations such as limited and efficient government, separation of powers, rule of law, democracy, and human rights protection. So in a nutshell, this would imply, among others, that while states are the subjects of a global constitutional order, they are at once, or at least should be, entirely subjected to binding and constraining international constitutional rules. Currently, no binding international law instrument, let alone a binding international environmental law instrument, provide for higher order binding constitutional norms. So the question is, if we accept this as being correct, can a global environmental constitution come about? Now, while several candidates have been proposed, most notable among these are three governmental or charter type global instruments. That is the World Charter for Nature, the Earth Charter and the IUCN Draft Covenant. Now, none of these are typical MEAs, multilateral environmental agreements. They are, as their name suggests, rather fashioned around the ideas of charters or covenants, a deliberate designation, I would suggest, which seeks to imbue these instruments with a distinct higher order constitutional flavor that announces sweeping ethically embedded and morally driven revolutionary change in a way that covenants or charters typically do. Reflecting on the nature and potential impact of covenants, Ron Engel says, the image of covenant and the rich constellation of ethical meanings that flow from it have the greatest potential of enabling us to see the majesty and the tragedy of our contemporary global situation, as well as to coordinate the insights of other images of our moral condition. The making of covenants is one of the most enduring ways in which human beings have established social relations founded on shared values and purposes. Now to this end, the advantage of a charter or covenantal approach for international environmental law lies in its ability to move away from a pure form of contractual values to an ethics-based, more representative, possibly more de democratic, 
and therefore more legitimate global representation, not only of global, global civil society and states themselves, but also the myriad moral and ethical values they hold dear. And this much is already exemplified by the UN Charter of 1945, which introduced a new peaceful, as far as that's possible, world order, um, and which itself is often considered the only proper candidate to fulfill the shoes of a global constitution. The constitutional significance of covenants, especially in the context of human rights, of course, is clearly evident on the covenants on civil and political rights and on economic, social and cultural rights. Now, could the World Charter for Nature be a global environmental constitution? The Charter was adopted with a majority vote by the UN General Assembly in 1982. 111 votes in favor, 18 abstentions, with, not surprisingly, the United States casting the only dissenting vote. Most comments would have it that the Charter is an avowedly ecological instrument which emphasizes the protection of nature as an end in itself. And this much is already evident from its title, which employs the altogether more ecologically inclined notion of nature instead of the predominantly utilitarian term environment that one finds in many other global environmental agreements. In the preamble of the Charter, the General Assembly acknowledges the benefits from nature depend on the maintenance of natural processes and on the diversity of life forms, um, as well as the need to protect and safeguard balance and quality of nature. The permanent sovereign rights of states are acknowledged, but the preamble emphasizes that states must, and I quote, conduct the activities in recognition of the supreme importance of protecting natural systems. So while not explicitly clear from this wording, terminology such as supreme importance arguably suggests a hierarchy in the sense that permanent sovereignty over natural resources is a secondary concern where the protection of nature is concerned. Following its preambular provisions, the Charter provides several general principles. And these include, for example, nature shall be respected and its essential processes shall not be impaired. Um, it speaks about the genetic viability of the Earth system and how to protect that. Um, and collectively seen, these principles, I'm not going to read all of them obviously, embrace the notions of respect and responsibility for nature, the need to observe Earth system limits and planetary boundaries, although it doesn't call it planetary boundaries, of course, and the need to preserve Earth system integrity. It also contains a function section um, stating, for instance, in the decision-making process, it shall be recognized that man's needs can be only met by ensuring the proper functioning of natural systems. It also contains the implementation part, um, and it directs states to implement several types of activities to achieve its, ob its objectives. Of particular importance is Article 14, which provides the principle set forth in the present charter shall be reflected in the law and practice of each state. Surprisingly, the World Charter for Nature has received scant attention from commentators. And where it did, analysis is usually cursorily with the uh, Charter mostly rele uh, 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 relegated to the realm of potential soft law. More curiously, the World Charter for Nature seems to have slipped off the radar of states' concern. Beyond its initial proclamation, it has not again featured prominently in or exerted any significant norm-shaping influence on the development of international environmental law. What happened instead was a clear retreat from the deep ecological principles of the World Charter for Nature during all major global governance conferences since the 1990s. And this, of course, is disappointing. I would argue that the Charter could play a pivotal role as part of a body of precedent-setting law and practice that has begun to take on the character of the international constitution for the world environment. And there are various reasons for this. First, while the character is a non-binding General Assembly resolution, the overwhelming endorsement it received from governments all over the world should not be relegated to a mere symbolic act, even though its symbolism is important. Second, perhaps more important than its symbolic significance, is the fact that the vast majority of governments 
were willing to support at the highest possible political level globally the provisions of the Charter. If not with the explicit intention to bind themselves legally to its provisions, then at least because they felt politically and morally inclined to do so. The Charter, after all, is the result of the political process that provides a global consensus of norms that are implicit in sustaining human and ecological health, as Nick Robinson says. Third, even if the World Charter for Nature never becomes a binding document, it still has legal effects, juridical value, and political and moral force because of the nature of the instrument that provides for it. Resolutions, for example, may determine standards for the application and interpretation of existing rules. They may justify reprisals. They may also serve as subsidiary means for the determination of rules of law. And finally, the World Charter for Nature, more than any other instrument of international environmental law, arguably most fully represents the idea of global environmental constitutionalism. It has been described special in nature. It is special because it was not only adopted, but also solemnly proclaimed in the same way that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was. It contains strong ethical principles of a very broad nature that underlines the system's approach. It is aimed at state and non-state parties, meaning that it also works horizontally. It in terms the obligatory forms such as shall instead of should. And while in some instances it reiterates existing principles of international environmental law, it also supplements these when necessary, thus reinforcing the belief that the Charter not only represents a codification of the fundamental rules which should be applied in order to achieve the conservation of nature, but also highlights the error, uh, the lacunae which exists in international law. As a final word, we all know that new initiatives are afoot to create yet another Charter or covenantal type global instrument that aspires to solicit greater political support for environmental protection. One example, some of us have been involved in the drafting of this document, uh, is the Global Pact for the Environment that's been driven by France and supported by the French President Emmanuel Macron. Now these continually emerging consensus seeking initiatives are important, of course, and they should be encouraged as critical means uh, to counter ever deepening political resistance against efforts to reorient global political, normative and ethical commitments to more comprehensively respond to the Anthropocene's global socio-ecological crisis. But instead of arduously pursuing yet another time-consuming initiative to convince world leaders to a binding global environmental instrument, which, let's be honest, in the case of the Global Pact for the, environmental, uh, for the Environment, disappointingly restates generally accepted principles of international environmental law, such as the polluter based principle, I would suggest that a far more lucrative option would be to reanimate the World Charter for Nature with the sole purpose of it serving as a global environmental constitution for the Anthropocene. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking our discussion to a new dimension of uh, structural uh, thought. Uh, we will now take our customary five minutes for comments and, and uh, questions. All right. Um, well, um, thank you very much for that talk. Um, I, the whole time you were talking, I couldn't help but thinking about my own presentation, which is so cabined into um, domestic law in the United States and what we're fighting in the United States right now, which is essentially all three branches of our government um, not recognizing even basic fundamental principles like climate change. Um, so I'm just, I guess I'm gonna ask you the million dollar question, which is how do we, you know, how, if for countries like the United States, we can't even, we're not presently capable at a governmental level of acknowledging some of the scientific principles that underlie the need for an international charter like this. How do we, how do we get there? Well, that, of course, is the million-dollar question, and I wish I had the answer to that. I suspect, I mean, in a nutshell, it is about getting the political commitment um, to signing up to, to such a covenant such as this, which hopefully in the end will filter down and also change our domestic systems. The point is, in 1982, 
governments all across the world, except the US, were actually willing and able to conclude this agreement. So my question is, is what has happened in, since 1982? Now, obviously, the, 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 the type of language that we've seen creeping into the Rio Declaration and so forth is all very anthropocentric and significantly departs from the type of ecological obligation that we see in the World Charter for Nature. Um, so it is also a, a, a matter of politics and political commitment, but the fact that we have the World Charter for Nature is, in my view, evidence enough that it is possible. Uh, obviously, currently with Donald Trump at the steer of things, it will be far more difficult to, to, to um, adopt a higher order type of constitutional, ecologically oriented legal provisions aimed at ecological care. So yes, that is the million dollar question. And what I do hope at least is that like the Earth Charter, something which Peter Burden, for example, has been heavily involved in as well, um, a document such as the Earth Charter and the World Charter for Nature, we do have the examples. We do have a blueprint which states can follow. The key question, as you say, of course, is getting the political commitment of governments to do that. It is as difficult in the US as it is currently, for example, in South Africa, just because of different reasons. But yes, that is going to be the big challenge. Um, Louis, thank you so much for that talk. Um, I just wondered if, I know there's a gathering happening next year of Earth Charter, um, World Charter for Nature, people gathering to try to get some momentum around a document like this. I wondered if you wanted to um, talk a little bit about that and maybe sh people here would be interested to hear what that gathering involves and I guess also whether or not you see that as an opportunity to get some support behind an initiative like this and get some political momentum. Um, Peter, yes, I'm not exactly sure which event you are specifically referring to. Um, oh. Is this the one that is led by Klaus Bosselmann? Exactly. I think it was, but I think it's involving the Earth Charter people and the world, the IECN and the um, Charter for Nature that you've been describing. It's a gathering of these various initiatives. So I think what you are saying is, and everyone present, you are welcome to follow the, uh, the, new, the new initiative by Klaus Bosselmann. Um, where we are trying to set up a global ecological law network, which very much complements all of the topics and the work that we've been dealing uh, in this current program here. Um, and I suspect that, 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 that this gathering or network will try and capitalize, and Peter, you, can, you are welcome to add to this, will capitalize on the successes that, uh, of existing in initiatives such as the Earth Charter. I mean, as we know, the Earth Charter is a civil society instrument. The idea would be to sell this to states, whereas the World Charter for Nature has, in effect, already been sold to states because they endorse it at the United Nations level. If we were able, through this initiative that you mentioned, Peter, to combine or, or, or amalgamate the ecological orientation or some of the elements of the World Charter for Nature, and the Earth Charter, I mean, I cannot imagine of anything more fantastic to guide to the, 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 the normative ecological development of law in future. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Well, thank you again. And